Hello everyone, welcome to our webcast today. We're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix. Today, Bryce Christensen, our Director of Services, will give us a look at using Varseek for variant analysis research. Bryce, I'll pass the mic to you. Cheryl, thank you very much for the introduction, and I too would like to welcome our audience today to have a look at VARSEEK and some of the important questions that you need to consider as part of research workflows when working with the VARSEEK software. If you have any questions along the way during our presentation today, go ahead and enter those in the Go to webinar question and answer window. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the conclusion of today's presentation. Our outline today will go something like this. We'll start out by talking more generally about VARSEEK and about variant analysis workflows and some of the strategies involved in setting up a research workflow. From there, we'll move the discussion on to a question that that a lot of people are asking, which is, what makes a variant damaging? And talk about some of the options available in VARSEEK to help you classify variants one way or another in that regard. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the quality control considerations to be aware of in sequence analysis. And from there, we'll move into an interactive demonstration of the VARSEEK software. We will be using real research data based on a family of five with a rare cardiovascular disease. So what is VARSEEK? I know some people joining us today are already quite familiar with the software. Some of you may be new to it. VARSEEK is the newest software tool in the Golden Helix suite of genetic analysis software. At a simple level, it is a tool for annotating DNA sequence variants, creating filter rules or decision rules to identify variants of interest, and then to rank those according to phenotypes. It's designed around the concept of making workflows repeatable. And especially in clinical and translational workflows, you'll find that VARSEEK is a very efficient way to um, analyze variants for making either diagnostic decisions or for screening patients for various types of mutations. Now, despite that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, now in addition to all of the tools there for rapid, repeatable workflows in high-throughput clinical environments, VARSEEK also has a lot of great functionality for working with research applications. VARSEEK has, of course, the powerful commercial grade interface. It's designed to run on local hardware, makes it very fast and responsive as the largest, most up-to-date repository of public annotations available. I should also say that in the recent release, we have included the ability to interface with the OncoMD database for MedGenome, so we're constantly expanding the annotation sources that are available to you. And the design of VARSEEK also has a lot of careful thought put into it, attention to detail and things like getting public data sources right in terms of how they're curated and <clears throat> presented to you to be as useful as possible. VARSEEK also gives you the options for a lot of useful data transformations, things like merging VCF and GVCF files, intelligent handling of multi-allelic sites, and you as the user have the ability then to get maximum value from your research data. Now when you're working in VARSEEK, there's sort of a typical workflow process that most people seem to follow. Of course, the software has the flexibility to do things in a lot of different ways, but typically you'll start by importing one or several VCF files, representing one or many samples to be analyzed as a batch. From there, VARSEEK allows you to annotate those variants using either public data sources or using your own custom data sources, whether it be proprietary databases that you've built up yourself over time or perhaps other sources you've found publicly available. 
From there, VARSEQ has a number of additional computation algorithms you might run, whether that be the allele counter algorithm that will give you some idea about the allele frequency in different subgroups of your data. Perhaps you have some cases and controls. There are other algorithms like the genotype zygosity tool that make some filtering workflows easier, the ability to match with the gene lists. Also, there's an expression editor built in that allows you to create your own custom annotation fields, either by applying mathematical functions or other logical functions to the data already in your VCF file or in other annotations. So once you've built up all of the variables that you might need in your analysis, VARSEQ allows you to construct what we call a filter chain to identify candidate variants. Filter chains can have multiple endpoints. You can also mix and match different types of logical operators, union sets or intersections to identify variants that fit very particular decision rules. Once then you've constructed a set of filters to identify the appropriate candidate variants that you want to review, then VARSEQ gives you additional options for downstream processing. That includes gene ranking algorithms that allow you to compare phenotypic terms to your genes of interest to identify any known relationships between them. Of course, many options for um, quality control on those variants to confirm that the variant is something that you can believe. Full integration with our Genome Browse product for reviewing BAM files, see the alignment data in the context of other annotations. There are options for committing those variants to a local database for future comparisons, and so on. So when all of these tools come together in one place, you can create some very powerful user um, user-defined research workflows. Now we recognize that in all of this that genomic annotations really are the key to success. Good variant analysis research begins with having accurate annotation data. And here at Golden Helix we invest a lot of time and effort in validating and maintaining those data sources for you to make sure that they are properly aligned, properly mapped, and have all of the right fields that you need in order to get maximum value from those annotation sources. Now you'll find that as you explore available annotation data, some will be focused more on quality control. That would be things that tell you a little bit about maybe problematic regions of the genome. Um, or perhaps they'll be focused more on analysis. That would be things like functional predictions or variant frequency data in different control populations and so on. But once you learn what the available annotations are, you can then proceed to construct appropriate um, variant annotation and filtering workflows for your data. Now, the big question that often arises, especially among newer VARSEQ users, is how do you define what is a damaging variant? What makes it deleterious, so to speak? And often what we see is that you'll start out with something of a process of elimination. You might have a concept based on previous research into the disease of what you think a variant might look like. Um, perhaps you expect it to be something that follows a recessive pattern. So you look for rare homozygous variants. Perhaps you have reason to believe that you're looking for a very rare or novel variant within a certain set of genes. Maybe you're looking specifically at splice site mutations. VARSEQ has tools that would allow you to isolate variants that fit any of those profiles. Once you've selected that set of variants, you can review additional annotations, find out if there are any hints as to which variants might be more likely than another to be driving your disease. But what annotation sources are available? What, um, which ones should you use? And on the next few slides, I'll just highlight some of the tools that are available in VARSEQ. Of course, this isn't an exhaustive list, but to begin, one of the standard tools you would use in VARSEQ is the variant classification tool. 
and this is able to take a list of variants from a VCF file, classify them into over 20 different categories. You see a list here of some of the different options that you might find, whether it's missense variants, five prime UTRs, splice donor variants. There's a lot of diversity of what you might find in a given exome or genome. These variant types are further classified by VARSEQ into three simple bins called loss of a function, missense, and other. Loss of function captures some of the most severe types of variants that would include things like frame shifts or stop gain variants. Missense captures all the other types of variation that are going to affect the amino acid sequence of the resulting gene product. While the other category largely captures things like synonymous and intergenic variants that are not expected to influence the gene product. So you can then create filter workflows that focus on individual types of variants or perhaps on some of these defined supersets. Now, of course, many of those different classifications may still include a lot of benign variation. You'll find a long list of missense variants that are probably not going to affect your phenotype in any way. So then you need to look beyond some of the other types of annotations that are available. One that we provide through VARSEQ is ClinVar. ClinVar is a public archive of variants that have been evaluated for potential causal relationships to some disease. Um, the submissions into ClinVar come from a lot of different sources, including a lot of major clinical laboratories who, after reviewing a variant, perhaps in a diagnostic case, will upload their decision into ClinVar. And it's really quite a large database. There are over 100,000 records. I believe the number is actually approaching 150,000 now. It's updated very frequently, and we update whenever a new version is released to the public. It will also be available in VARSEQ. Now, another place you might look would be functional predictions. And functional predictions is a topic that uh, really can fill a webcast of its own. In fact, we did one such webcast recently that you can find on our website. But simply put, Functional predictions use algorithmic approaches. Usually it's a machine learning approach to determine the expected consequence of a variant, or in many cases, it's actually analyzing the resulting amino acid change. There are a lot of different algorithms out there, things like SIFT, Polyfin, Mutation Taster, Mutation Assessor that you may have heard of. Within VARSEQ, our preferred way of handling these is through the DBNSFP database. This is the database for non-synonymous functional predictions. It's a free tool developed by Dr. Xiaoming Liu at the University of Texas. And it catalogs pre-computed functional prediction scores for pretty much all of the possible missense SNPs within the genome. Now there's also a companion product to DBNSFP called DBSCSNV that we also provide in VARSEQ. DBSCSNV focuses on splice site mutations. Similar to DBNSFP, it has a catalog of pre-computed scores, but the scores that it gives are focused within splice consensus regions at the exon intron boundary, and scores variants for whether or not they're likely to affect the splicing of that gene as part of the RNA transcription process. So you can imagine that if the gene is not spliced appropriately, of course, it may disrupt the function of that gene significantly. So that's a couple more ways of potentially defining damaging variants. Now, you may also find that um, gene ranking is a useful feature. In um, one of the recent releases to VARSEQ, we included a new function called FORANK. FORANK is an algorithm that uses human phenotype ontology and gene ontology terms to assess the relationship between genes and phenotypes. So as the user, you're prompted to enter phenotypic terms 
which it will then compare with the genes present in your data to identify any known relationships and produce a score and a rank. So here we see an example where in this particular table from Varseq, there were 115 variants in 50 different genes, which might be kind of a large search space to begin with, but when you look at those individual genes and compare them with the gene ontology, in this case using the cardiovascular phenotype, we can quickly identify several genes that have the strongest known ontology relationships and have an idea where to start looking for a causal variant among those 50 genes. Now, <clears throat> okay, so once you've identified a set of candidate variants that you believe may be connected to your phenotype, of course you need to review those variants, make sure that all of the data is supportive, that there's no evidence of perhaps some technical problem that might um, discount the validity of the variant. Now, um, as you look at quality control options, uh, there are a lot of things to consider. Number one, I would point out rare variants deserve special attention. For example, we see fairly often with de novo mutations that if you go back and look at the alignment, that maybe they fall in a problematic region of the genome, maybe a segmental duplication or some place where there is reason to believe that the variant is a false positive. And this is especially problematic in my experience with rare variants. It's not unusual to find a common variant. There, if it's there, there's um, good reason to believe that it really exists. But with rare variants, the false positive rate seems to be a little higher. Now, what can you look at? Um, within your VCF files or your BAM files, you'll usually have a lot of important quality data, things like read depth, quality scores, maybe strand bias statistics, a number of other machine statistics that might give you some clues about the variant quality. But also there are a lot of useful public annotations that you can look at, um, things that I generally refer to as mappability annotations. Now, mappability is not a new subject by any means, but it's something that I've heard come up more often in recent conversations with some of our clients, and so I'd like to just talk about it briefly. The issue here is that the human reference genome has some regions that are known to be difficult for current sequencing technology. Next-gen sequencing processes usually sequence short DNA fragments. We align them back to the reference genome to identify variants, and the vast majority of those sequences are aligned correctly. But occasionally, we find some sequences that don't align uniquely to one place or another, or they might align incorrectly. But luckily, we can predict many of the trouble spots. And there's an example here in this image on the right where in this sort of sequence alignment, we usually expect vertically that all of the bases will be identical or perhaps a 50-50 split in the case of a heterozygote. And occasionally you find these regions where there's a lot of disagreement in the alignment about what is really going on there. And often there's a very good reason for that. Now, one of the first places I usually look is segmental duplications. These are a pretty common confounder and help you find regions where your sequence may not uniquely align to just that one place. UCSC has a widely used source called genomic superdupes for segmental duplications. That data source is available through VARSEQ as well. And there's an example of it right here that came up in a case we evaluated quite recently where we identified what looked like a uniparental disomy feature where the child in a family trio is homozygous for an alternate allele, but only one parent carried that allele. But on further review, we found that it was within a segmental duplication that had over 98% similarity to another region elsewhere in the genome. And when we compared back and forth between the two regions and the sequences aligning in each place, 
it became clear that it was very likely that this genotype call was a false positive. So that's the kind of thing that I encourage you to look out for. Now there are some emerging standards in this space. There are several groups that are working on best practice guidelines for genome mappability issues. The Thousand Genomes Project supplies um, data sources for what they call the accessible genome as well as low complexity regions. The Genome in a Bottle Consortium has been working on the question as well. Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, working together with National Institute of Standards and Technology, has also released some really interesting data in this regard. One of the more interesting things out there that I've seen is this mappability by read length. So quite often in next-gen sequencing, we're either working with 100 base reads or 150 or 250 base reads. And depending on the length of your reads, there are certain areas of the genome that may be more or less accessible to you. And they provide a really nice annotation source that says if you have, say, 150 base reads, this, these are the areas that you can reasonably expect to successfully sequence. Now just to show two quick examples of this. I mentioned the low complexity regions annotation from Thousand Genomes Project. Here we see in the reference sequence a dinucleotide repeat. We also see a homopolymer out here to the right. And you can see in this BAM file with this sequence alignment pile up a lot of confusion going on in that area. Some aligners will handle this better than others. But if, for example, this position had been called as an AC heterozygote, I would be very concerned about whether or not that was a real variant. One more example. Um, in this image, we see up here in blue on the first line, the accessible genome definition according to the Thousand Genomes Project, and we see a gap here where they say this region's not accessible. Then just below, we see from GA4GH the regions that are accessible for 150 base read length, which is what we have in this particular image, and again, there's a gap there. And we see in the genome browse pile up this cross hashing, which indicates the presence of multi-mapped reads. It means we have many sequences that are aligned here but could align elsewhere. And we see what appears to be a variant there that at first glance you might think is a homozygous variant. But when you look closer, you might recognize that only about 90% of the reads are for that alternate allele. There are a number of reads that don't map uniquely there. This is the kind of thing that you might call into question in terms of its validity. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on a little bit. And let's look at an interactive example of how you might apply some of these annotations and techniques. So we're going to look at data that is publicly available through SRA. It's exome sequencing of five individuals from a family with cardiac conduction disease. And I'll tell you right now how it ends. They originally determined in the publication about this family that it was due to a mutation in the LMNA gene. So we're going to see if we can replicate that result using VARSIC. Now, as we look at the structure of this family, there are a few important points to consider. First of all, we can see that there are three siblings who are affected with the disease. Their father also is affected. The grandparents are uncertain. Anybody with this arrow was sequenced. So we have sequencing for the three affected siblings for a child of one of those siblings whose phenotypic status is uncertain. And we have sequence for the healthy mother. So the mother can serve as perhaps a negative control for us here. Now based on the pedigree, we can see there's apparent male-to-male -male transmission of the disease, so we can probably rule out an X-linked model. We can't necessarily rule out either dominant or recessive transmission, but we know from literature that inherited forms of cardiac conduction diseases are quite rare. We also know this family has East Asian ancestry, so we should incorporate that into our analysis. 
So with that, let's go ahead and jump out of the slides and take a closer look at Varseek. So if you're seeing Varseek for the first time today, I'd like to start by just telling you a little bit about the workspace. When you import data to Varseek, of course, you'll usually start from VCF files. And it creates a tabular view of all of the data contained in those VCF files. In this case, I have all five sequenced individuals lined up here so I can see their genotypes, quality scores, and a zygosity column. Now, as you may be aware, VCF files contain a lot of data, and there are many other values that we're not showing right now, but they are all there. They're accessible. You can turn them on if you want to see them. And also, by clicking anywhere in the table, Varseq will give you feedback. So if you're not sure what one of these columns is, by clicking on it, you'll get a definition of what the column is, together with a visual representation of the distribution of that variable. So you can get an idea of kind of the range of values that are there. And moving across, you can get similar information about any data column. So I can see the genotype quality distribution in the mother. Most of them are very high, but there is a long tail out to the left. Now, once you have your VCF data in Varseek, it allows you to add additional annotation sources. If I move over to the right, you can see that those annotation sources are appended onto the data table. And as we review here, we can see the first annotation that was applied was this variant classification that we talked about, where if I click on the header, I see a distribution of the types of variants that are present. So 3' UTR is the most prevalent type of variation here, followed by missense variants and so on. There's also that combined effect that I talked about that bins it up into three groups so we can see how many fall into that loss of function category, miss sense, and other. Now, the next field that we see is this allele counts. This is an algorithm that runs within Varseq. In this case, it took about three seconds to run on 98,000 input variants, and it counts how often each variant occurs both in the unaffected and the affected individuals together with a calculation of the allele frequency, again, both in affected and unaffected separately. And moving on from there, we see a number of other annotations that have been applied, whether it's allele frequencies from the 1000 Genomes Project, where we can see there are a lot of very common alleles represented in this family, to the ClinVar annotations, where we can see that there are a number of variants here that are previously classified as pathogenic, so we'll come back to those. We see the functional predictions, the splice site predictions. I also went ahead and added in the segmental duplications here so we can see how often we are encountering segmental duplications in the data. And I downloaded and applied the data from the 1000 Genomes Accessible Genome Mask so we can see that about 8% of these variants are expected to be outside of accessible regions. Now, what if you want to add more data to the table? Here we have kind of a standard set of starter annotations. You can add more data by going to the annotate with data source function, where initially you can review the available public annotation sources. So for ClinVar, I can select that. It gives me a description of what that database is, a listing of the fields in the database, and also some curation notes. So if we did anything special in how we handled the data in processing it, you'll always know exactly what we've done. So we try to be very, very transparent in that regard. Now, any of these different databases can be downloaded and made available locally. So if I download this, it will then appear in my local data repository where I can select it to add into the table and use it a little bit more efficiently. So if, for example, I want to add in variant frequency data from the ESP database, I can select that. 
We'll take just a moment. We see that the table has been updated to show fields from that database. It's running the calculation in real time here. We see that took between five and 10 seconds to annotate 98,000 variants with their frequency data and other fields from ESP. So I'll hide that for the moment and let's focus on the next step. So once you have annotations in place with Varseq, it allows you to create filters based on any field in the table. So for example, if I look at this thousand genomes data and inspect the frequency distribution and say, I just want to focus on the rarest variants, you can right click on that column and create a filter card. When you do that, it makes a box up here in the top left. So let's talk about these filter boxes. Each box defines a set of filters that helps you to uh, reduce your data. And we see here the total number of input variants is 98,000, so 100% of the total. Then we see that there's a filter box here called preliminary filters that sends out 21,000 variants or 22% of the total. I can open that up to see details and see this is actually a set of four filters that have been combined together. One reduces the data to autosomes. The next removes variants that are outside of the accessible regions. At that point, we're down to 88,000 or 92% of the input. Another filter was applied that reduces the data by removing variants that are in seg dupes that have a really high similarity to other regions. And then finally, there's a filter here that looks at the East Asian allele frequency from the Thousand Genomes Project. And if we open this up a little bit so we can see the details, we can see that it's set a threshold at 5% and is removing anything that is either equal to or greater than 5%. So it's keeping variants that are novel to the database or they're not annotated or missing or that are present at below 5%. So we're focusing on somewhat rare variants here. Now the nice thing about Varseq is you get very responsive feedback. If I change this threshold, immediately it updates to say there are 18,000 variants that now um, pass through the filter rather than the, I believe it was 21,000 before or if I want to go to a less restrictive threshold, I can update and again, I see 25,000. So many more are passing through. So this type of responsive feedback makes Varseq very useful, very powerful in exploratory data analysis workflows. Now let's look at this next set of filters. So first we had a set of four filters that are being applied in sequence to reduce from 98,000 variants in the input to 21,000, which we know are in the autosomes. They're in accessible regions based on two different annotation sources and have a frequency less than 5%. So we have moderately rare variants that we expect are in uh, pretty good quality regions. Now, on this next stage, we have a set of filters that has been configured differently. So I said earlier in the presentation, you can create filters using either intersection or union logic. Here, we're looking at a union logic where there are five filters being applied in parallel and we're capturing the union of their outputs. So what we've done here is use a few different ways to identify things that might be damaging. So we're trying to be as inclusive as we can in that regard. So first we can look at ClinVar. ClinVar says two of these variants are previously classified as likely pathogenic, 10 as pathogenic, a total of 11, so there must be some crossover between them. If I click this number 11, the table updates to show me exactly those 11. And it's kind of interesting to take a closer look at these so we can see how they've been classified if they've been classified by one or several submitters, we get some idea about confidence there. Also, we can see what disease they've been classified for. 
And so there's one here that has been submitted multiple times, but if we look at the diseases, two times it's been submitted for something related to a cardiovascular disease. So that immediately becomes a very interesting candidate for this um, cardiac disease we're looking at now. Now as we look through the other filters, I won't go into any detail on them, but this ADA score is from the splice prediction annotations. We see 171 variants that might affect gene splicing. The next column here is based on the functional predictions from DB and SFP, and what we've done is require that at least four of the five methods agree that a variant might be damaging. We see 715 of those. All of the loss of function variants are being passed through, and then in this last column, missense variants are being passed through if they occur at very low frequency. And so hopefully you can see here there's a lot of flexibility in how you construct filters. You can define damaging variants in different ways. You can define your quality thresholds in different ways to ultimately produce the set of variants that make sense for your research question. Now, we see here a total of 3,920 variants that pass through at least one of our damaging filters. That's still a lot of data. How are we going to decide now which variants to focus on for follow-up? It turns out that we have yet to apply what is probably the most powerful filter available to us in this data, which is the family structure. So what I'd like to do now is walk through the process of creating some filters based on that family structure. I'm going to create a union filter here where I can apply two different workflows. We'll say one of them is the recessive data workflow, or sorry, the recessive variance, and one will be based on dominant. So how do we identify the variants that might follow a recessive pattern? So we've got three individuals that are affected. We want to find where all three of them are homozygous. Luckily, we have that data right in front of us here in this allele counts column that was generated by Varsi. What this does is it, it counts how many of the affected individuals or unaffected individuals are homozygous for the given variant. So here I can select that column to create a filter. So it immediately creates that new filter box. I can set the threshold that I'm looking for. And I can see that out of those 3,900 variants that most of them have less than three of the affected individuals homozygous. 45 have all three of them homozygous. And of course, no cases of greater than three. So let's look at those 45. If we update the table now to those 45, we can see that among the unaffected individuals, it still occurs with some frequency. And for a recessive model, we want to make sure at least that the ones we know are unaffected are not homozygous. And we know that the mother is unaffected. So if we come over to the mother's data, I can add another filter there and say, show me where the mother is not homozygous. So that allows the mother to be heterozygous, reference, or missing. I can define those filters and see four variants that follow a recessive pattern. Now, as we explore this data a little bit, I can click on each row and Varsi shows me some details so I can get some idea about the genotype qualities, sample by sample. Uh, for the most part, they look pretty good, although this last one looks like we've got some really low quality. If I take a closer look at the read depths, I can see that the depths are also kind of sketchy on this one. So I might ignore that particular variant, but the others look pretty good. Now let's talk about the dominant filter chain. The process here will be largely the same, except this time we're focusing more on heterozygous variants. We could construct something that allows for the affected individuals to be either heterozygous or homozygous. As it is, I'll just 
go strictly heterozygous for now, which is most likely with a rare variant. So let's look at where all three of the affected individuals are heads. So it's just a couple clicks to set that up. We see there are 1,000 such variants, but we also need to make sure that the mother's not a carrier for this one because she's unaffected. So let's come back over to the mother one more time. Create one more filter there. So we can see a lot of these, the mother is a carrier. Um, in many cases, even homozygous. So let's just focus on where the mother is reference genotype or perhaps unknown. We see there are 171. Combined with the four that are recessive, we have 175 candidates to look at now. So as we examine those candidates, maybe the first thing I want to do is find out how many genes are represented among those 175 variants. So there's an option here to group by gene names. This will take just a moment. It creates a new table where now I see a listing of all of the genes present. And this updates if I look at other lists in the table so I can see how many genes are represented in the 3,900 potentially damaging. But still, even at 162 genes, it's a lot of data to process. So if we want to rank these and get a better idea of the most likely causal variants, we can run a computation. So I mentioned the gene ranking algorithm earlier, FORANK. FORANK, when you run it, first it prompts you for a field that captures gene names, but then it allows you to enter phenotypic terms for any or all of the individuals in the data. Here, I'll just um, start typing, and you'll notice that as I start typing a term, it prompts me with a list of matching terms. So this is based on standardized terms from HBO, Human Phenotype Ontology. And as I look through the list, there's one here for abnormal atrioventricular conduction. That should be an appropriate match for cardiac conduction disease. I could proceed to add additional terms for that sample or different terms for the others if they had something unique. We'll go ahead and run this with a single term so you can see how it works. Now immediately, you see here with the gene list, it has created a set of columns that it will fill in with the gene rank, the gene score, and the path that defines the relationship between the gene and the phenotype terms. We can make that a little bigger. Now also if we go back to the variant table, we see the same fields have been added here. And this will take just a moment to finish and keep in mind, not only is it ranking these 175 variants, it is ranking the entire universe of 98,000 variants, at least to the extent that they fall within the boundaries of the gene. That way, when we're done, if we want to go back and look at some different combinations of filters, we'll still have that ranking there for us. So now that this is finished, we can look at the gene rank or the gene score, sort, and take a closer look at how these play out. If we look at the distribution of these gene ranks, you can see there are just a few up here at the top. Most of the genes are falling behind. And so maybe we want to start by reviewing the ones that are above 90. So we see three that are clearly above 90, and we see a few more that are clearly above 80. But surprise, surprise, look what comes out on top, LMNA. So that's the one that we saw in the abstract or in the title of the article was what they determined as being the most likely causal variant. LMNA in the ontologies has a direct link with abnormal atrioventricular conduction. While moving down the list, looks like some of these have to take a multi-step path to get from the gene name to the term of interest. Now, as we explore the data that's available to us here, I can look at LMNA and see 
the read depth and the quality scores for all five members of the family. I can move down and see any of the different terms in the fields from the table. So I can see that this one does not happen to be in ClinVar, but I could look at the predictions and see that all of the methods uniformly predict this to be damaging or functional. But also now I can take a closer look at this in Genome Browse. So the nice thing with Genome Browse in VARSEQ is that it makes interactive analysis very easy. It gives lots of great feedback. As I click any variant in the table, the browser view updates to exactly that location. So for example, with the LMNA, I can immediately see here the genotypes for all members of the family. So I have three heterozygotes and two non-carriers here. Clicking gives all of the information from the VCF file about those individuals. I can see from the annotations that we're in a safe region according to this accessible genome annotation that we talked about. I can look at the functional predictions and see exactly what we already know from the annotations earlier, but we can get all of the raw data like the SIFT scores and the polyphen scores to see exactly what evidence there is behind this variant. Now also, if you have alignment data that you want to look at, you can always add those alignments into the browser as well. So here we can look at this variant in one of the three affected siblings click to find out how many reads there are, how many reads for each of the two bases, even if we need to be able to zoom into the level of seeing the individual bases and click to get the technical data about the individual reads. Okay, so with that I think we've covered a lot of ground in VARSEQ. Of course we haven't looked at every possible function yet, but there are many, many options here for interactive data analysis with immediate feedback to the user and exploring your data in different ways in research settings. So hopefully as we've gone through this, you've seen some things that might help you in your own research work. VARSEQ, as we've discussed, is a great tool for variant annotation, variant filtering, variant ranking. It enables exploratory analysis like no other tool that I'm aware of. The GUI gives immediate feedback. Pretty much every mouse click gives you information about what you are looking at in VARSEQ. And of course the rich visualizations with Genome Browse make it possible to review your data from just about any, imaginal, any dimension you can imagine. So if you have any questions about the product or would like more information, feel free to contact us through our website or by email. And with that, Cheryl, I'll go ahead and swing this back to you. Thank you, Bryce. Um, we are going to answer a few questions. Um, we did run, uh, we are close to the top of the hour, so we'll take what we can. Um, if you haven't had a chance to enter them in, feel free to go ahead and do that now. Um, I will get the webcast recording and slides up on our website just as soon as I can. That should be today. If not, it will be tomorrow. Our next, our next webcast is coming up on Wednesday, July 8th, and that will be presented by Dr. Raluca Matiscu. Um, she is from the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida, and her focus is on, on cattle, sheep, and goat molecular genetics. Um, all right, let's go ahead and answer some questions. Let's see here. Um, one that's popping up um, frequently is that you've you mentioned the pipeline in OncoMD. Can you expand a little bit on that, Bryce? Okay, so um, we didn't cover those in any detail today, but in the latest release of VARSEQ, we did add two new features that are going to be especially useful in clinical and translational workflows. One is the integration with the OncoMD database from MedGenome, which gives really extensive information about somatic mutations 
about the types of tissues they've been observed in, the studies that have reported on those mutations, the ongoing clinical trials related to those mutations, as well as any known drug response factors. So we're really excited about the OncoMD integration. Also, there was a bullet point in the slide that someone must have noticed about the pipeline capabilities of Varsic. And in this latest release, we've enabled command line access to Varsic so that if you have set up a filtering and annotation template using the Varsic GUI, you can then run that filter and annotation process on samples for more of a command line interface. It enables you to incorporate Varseq into an automate, excuse me, an automated um, laboratory process and get a lot of results really fast. Um, this one just popped in. Are there, is there documentation or documents for the command line interface? It says docs. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, so documentation on the command line interface is a, honestly a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that that is in process. Okay. Um, I will shout out specifically to Jason. I will get you more information okay. on that directly. Um, how did you get the cohort calls sh showing in genome browse? Um, so let's go back and take a quick look at that. So um, I believe what he's referring to is the information we were seeing here in the details window. The details window interfaces both with the genome browse window and the data table. And when you click any row in the data table, this will show you all of the currently visible fields from the table. So when I click this row, I see all of the genotype calls corresponding to the variant in that row. Click a different row, again it updates to show the information from that row. Now within Genome Browse, um, <clears throat> you may have been looking at this part of the plot that is showing the genotypes. And you can get that from the table by clicking the little Genome Browse icon and saying plot unfiltered variants. What it does is it creates this, um, this area of the plot that's showing all of the variant calls in the sample. So you can zoom out to genome level, go back in and take a closer look at wherever the data resides. And so it's very similar to how you might view a VCF file in the freestanding version of Genome Browse, but you get it uh, just by plotting the data from the data table. Okay, does Varseq scale to cohort scale exome analysis? So um, Varseq does scale well to very large batches of data. Here we have five samples that we've brought in. You can work with larger numbers. Um, <clears throat> I know we've tested it with up to a few hundred at least, but what you'll find is that our SVS package has more options for statistics when you're working with large cohorts like that. Varseq does work very nicely if you're focused on individual variants as the output. If you want to do gene level statistics, then you might find that SVS is more useful there. How often are the links to filtering databases updated? That's a great question. If we look in here at the annotation database, and I'll look at the public version. Number one, you'll notice that there is a date stamp associated with each of these, but also I can look back and see the history on how often some of these have been updated. You see ClinVar, for example, is updated practically every month. In general, we tend to review the database at least quarterly to check for updates. Things like ClinVar that we know are being updated on a monthly basis, we will keep up with those releases. And of course, if the 
user base lets us know that something's out of date, we'll usually get that taken care of right away. Great. Thank you, Bryce. I am not seeing more questions popping in, so I think we can go ahead and wrap for the day. Um, everyone on the line, I will send you the link to the recording and slides just as soon as I have it. Bryce, I thank you very much for your time and an excellent presentation. You're welcome. And thank you to everyone out there joining, and we will see you next time. Have a great day.